thank you for coming to this, this Dean Speaker Series. I'm Rich Lyons, Dean here at Berkeley Haas. It is one of our, as you know, it is our top most speaker program, and we have an absolutely terrific speaker today, as you know. I also want to welcome both, both the 15s and the 16s in our executive MBA program. You are here for a crossover block, and it is great to have you overlapping, connecting with one another, and of course, as always, connecting with the rest of the, the school. I also want to thank Mukun Chavan, who is the EMBA student that uh, helped to bring uh, Dr. Chu to us here today. So thank you very much for all your help. So let me, let me introduce Dr. Chu, because he is the reason we are here. He is currently a professor of physics and molecular and cell physiology at Stanford. He previously served, as you know, as Secretary of Energy. That was 2009 to 2013 under President Obama. At the time of his appointment, as Energy Secretary, 2009, he was working here on the Berkeley campus. He was a professor of physics here at Berkeley and also a professor of MCB, molecular and cell biology. He served and was serving at that time as the director of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. This is, for those that don't know, just up the hill, literally, from the Haas School. An early advocate for finding scientific solutions for climate change, Dr. Chu guided Berkeley Lab on a new mission to become the world leader in alternative and renewable energy research. Earlier in his career, after receiving his PhD from Berkeley in 1976, he went to work for Bell Labs, a place he remembers fondly for its intensely innovative culture. While working at Bell Labs, Dr. Chu was part of a team that won the Nobel Prize. That was 1997. Throughout his career, Dr. Chu has been a leader in many capacities, working both as a hands-on scientist and also as a fine administrator. For all he has accomplished and his unwavering dedication to his field, Dr. Chu truly embodies what we talk about, the best of Berkeley. Today, he is speaking to us on the topic of climate change. He said that getting to a sustainable world is a problem that the best scientists have both an opportunity and a duty to help solve. I'm sure we will hear today that it is a duty that extends to us all as well and to current and future business leaders. I can think of no one better suited to point the path to solving these problems. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chu back to Berkeley. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, let me just, um, what the heck is going on here? Power, PowerPoint, slideshow, presenter view. Um, I do this, I prepare these things. I prepared it on the way over here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna talk about energy, climate change, transition to sustainable world, and uh, a little bit about um, my experiences at, um, at uh, Department of Energy insofar as it has some bearing on what you do. So let me just begin and just, here's an outline of the talk. Uh, begin with the risks of climate change. I know you know all these things, but very quickly, just to review it, this is the history of the land and ocean surface temperature from 1850 to 2014. Um, you might notice that the year 2014 was the hottest year on record, uh, and the 14 out of the 15 hottest years on record were in the 21st century. and uh, there were only 14 years in the 21st century. And uh, this fifth year, 2015, uh, will be up there as well. Um, well, I came from Washington, spent four and a third years in Washington, D.C., and a lot of people in D.C. noted that the climate isn't changing. Uh, for example, in that red bar over there, it's been roughly flat in temperature. So therefore, clearly, you guys are all wrong. It's not changing. <laughs> They don't talk about this because if they talk about that, they have to acknowledge what happened in between. Now, what, what is going on? Why is, why is the temperature plateauing? And it was true that in the last 15 years, the climate models did not predict this. Um, and so let me just tell you briefly about what has been discovered only in the last year. Uh, this uh, person is holding a buoy. Um, they drop it from airplanes. They're battery powered. They bob around in the ocean. They go up and down uh, from the surface down to, in this case, these surveys, two kilometers deep. They measure the temperature of the ocean, the salinity of the ocean, 
When they resurface, that little antenna sends the data via satellite to uh, a, a data logging center. So they drop these all around the ocean to figure out what's the temperature of the ocean. Not only the surface temperature, but what's down below. They drop them all over the place. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of them, uh, nearly 4,000, and they're getting better and better. But then they've dropped by different countries, and it really gives a reasonable coverage of what the temperature of the oceans are. So let me cut to the chase. The heat went in the ocean. Not on the surface of the ocean. A very subtle change in the deep water surface water mixing of the ocean actually increased more of the energy in the deep water. The climate models don't predict the very subtle changes in the uh, conveyor belts of the ocean. But we have measurements that say, no, that's where the heat went. It actually is a full accounting of the energy. Uh, energy hitting the Earth, measured by satellites, the same. Energy going out, less because of the greenhouse gas effect. That's just physics. And so where was the energy going? Well, it, here is where it's going. So it's beginning to make more sense. Uh, it also shows that we have to refine our climate model. Another thing that's happening in climate is uh, measurements in the local acceleration due to gravity. These are two satellites that orbit the Earth in a polar orbit. So as the Earth spins underneath, these satellites are able to monitor what's happening that would perturb the orbits of these satellites. The distance between these two satellites are measured to within a fraction of the width of a human hair. And local changes in gravity then can be extracted from the perturbations in the orbits. And this is what they measured. This is a map of Greenland. Uh, from 2002 to 2013, this light shadow is Greenland. Where you see red, you see mass increasing, the acceleration due to gravity increasing. There is no red. <laughs> where you see blue and purple, the acceleration due to gravity is decreasing. Due to what? Due to melting glaciers. And for example, in Jakobshaven Glacier, uh, it's pretty good. You see summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter. It, the uh, satellites can measure millimeter changes in ice packs two miles deep. And what you see is not only are the glaciers melting, but they're accelerating in their melt, not only in Greenland, but in most places around the world. Most recent data in Antarctica. Antarctica used to have um, uh, one part of it gaining in ice, uh, the western part losing in ice. Now, on balance, it's tipped in the last five years only one way. Western Antarctica is uh, losing a lot of ice. Same with the Himalayan glaciers, same with many other places around the world. So it's not taking pictures of glaciers anymore. We have a universal worldwide survey of glaciers melting. Um, I should also say we have a universal worldwide survey of water in underground aquifers. And let me just say the underground aquifer uh, depletion in California shows up like a light bulb. Uh, 15 cubic kilometers of water per year over the last four years. Because take out the water, the acceleration to gravity is less. Uh, all right, let me uh, remind you of something we learned, we're supposed to have learned in the last 50 years. Uh, this is a history of cigarette smoking uh, males in 1900 to 2005. And in 1900, that black curve are adult males smoking cigarettes. We, did, we were not a smoking country. But by uh, middle 1960s, the average consumption of cigarettes per male per year was 220 packs a year, including the non-smokers. 220 packs a year, including the non-smokers. Then what happened in the 40s and 50s is something began to happen. What used to be a rare, very rare form of cancer shot out of the noise and said, what is going on? By the 50s and 60s, uh, the epidemiologists, those are people who try to track correlations in health and other things, said, you know, we suspect this has something to do with smoking. And uh, by 1964, the Surgeon General of the United States was able to put on the package of cigarettes, a warning, a mild warning saying, caution, cigarette smoking 
may be hazardous to your health. Next Surgeon General wanted cigarette smoking is hazardous to your health, and the incoming president fired him. Uh, <laughs> now, there was a massive campaign to educate school kids, grade school kids, junior high school kids, high school kids, not to smoke cigarettes. It worked. Uh, cigarette smoking declined, and um, male deaths due to uh, cigarette smoking also declined, uh, but they declined later. There's about a 25-year lag statistically between the time you start smoking and when you get lung cancer, which, if not caught early enough for surgery, is, remains a fatal disease. Uh, uh, people have pointed out that uh, women did follow later. Uh, they were clearly evidence that they're smarter than men. That may be absolutely true but it was a women's liberation movement that allowed them to smoke. <laughs> so they too started dying of lung cancer. Uh, what, is, what am I telling you this, and what does this have to do with climate change? Well, first, we know today if you smoke a pack of cigarettes a day, you have a 25 times higher chance of getting lung cancer. And if you count up all the other disease, congestive lung disease, uh, things of that nature, coronary heart disease, stroke, it is the major health risk in the United States today that's preventable, bar none. All right, what does this have to do with climate change? Well, uh, the damage to environment is not known, just as if you started smoking 20 years ago, you might have started to unleash a series, it takes a series of mutations in order to get these uh, cancers. Uh, and, uh, but that's not to say if you're smoking, still try to stop, <laughs> because it's not too late until you're dead. But in any case, <laughs> uh, but in any case, I think um, the damage known to what we've done already with carbon dioxide it will not be known, not for 25 years, but in actual fact, we don't know because we don't know how long it will take the oceans to warm up. Remember, we, we, we missed that. Uh, it's an estimate of maybe 50, maybe 100, maybe 150 years. If we stop emitting carbon dioxide today, everywhere humans in the world, it would take, let's say, a century to warm up to a new equilibrium position from what we've already done. Then you say, well, no, well, if we stop emitting carbon dioxide, the, you know, the oceans, by the way, grab more than 50% of the emitted carbon dioxide. That's folded into not only the models, but the behavior of the Earth. And won't the Earth repair itself? And the answer is, how long will the net increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that circulates between the oceans and the atmosphere and, and the land, how long will that be? We don't know. It's estimated anywhere between 300 and 3,000 years. So that's like smoking, but the secondary smoke goes on for a millennia, roughly. OK? Uh, now, here's a good thing. Not to worry. This is not my problem. So far, society is saying that. I like smoking. I don't want to give it up. Am I going to be willing to take a half a percent hit in the GDP and my lifestyle to worry about my grandchildren or great-grandchildren? I'm not even going to know my great-grandchildren. And oh, by the way, the great-grandchildren around the world feels good. Okay? That's, what, that's so far the decision the United States and the world is making. All right, let's talk about trends in oil and natural gas. And the question is, Will the problem take care of itself? Will we run out of oil and natural gas? So I'm going to quote uh, some people I really deeply respect. I'll read it to you. Our ability to find and extract fossil fuels continues to improve, and economically recoverable reservoirs around the world are likely to keep pace with the rising demand for decades. What did I do? Huh. What happened? I said that. <laughs> uh, why did I say that? Here's some uh, history of US oil production uh, in 1945 to 2012. Uh, US 
oil production peaked around 1970. That orange stuff is the great Alaskan oil find, but that uh, didn't alone could not uh, decrease production. Uh, but then you see that little tight little thing, that triangle that's called tight. This is oil that's recoverable from fracturing rock with horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. Uh, it started about seven or eight years ago. It really started in the 70s with research uh, done by the Department of Energy, but by 2013, our production's up to seven and a half million barrels a day. By 2014, eight and a half million barrels a day. Uh, this increase, since the beginning of that wedge, four and a half million barrels a day, is more oil produced than anywhere in the world except three countries, Saudi Arabia, the United States, and Russia. It's more oil than it's produced in Iran and Iraq combined, with Venezuela, Mexico, all those countries. This is a lot of oil. Um, and if you look at the future reserves of oil around the world, not only this oil, but so-called heavy oil, the heavy oils in Venezuela and other places, uh, the offshore oils going a mile deep is now, quote, routine, Arctic oil, oil sands of Canada and other places. Um, most of the oil, future oil reserves, are harder to get, more CO2 intensive to get, but we won't run out, in my mind, certainly for a century, even with the rising demand. Okay, so, so uh, now, a former Saudi oil minister, Sheikh Yamani, said the Stone Age came to an end, not for lack of stones, and the oil age will end, but not for lack of oil. That is not why he's a former Saudi oil minister. <laughs> <laughs> because you, you can read this in several ways, okay? Uh, you transition to better solutions. So we went from the Stone Age to the Metal Ages because metals were better. We don't look at stones on the ground and said, Stranded assets, <laughs> right? <laughs> it doesn't happen. Uh, and so um, how do you transition to better solutions, number one? And the other flip side is if you don't find better solutions to oil and natural gas especially, it will come out of the ground. If you're a country that has oil and natural gas and you can pump money out of the ground, you will do it. It's just a reality. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So let's talk about uh, some good news, science and technology. First, let me remind you that a third to half of what has to be done is to stop wasting money. <laughs> it's called energy efficiency. This is from a study uh, that uh, my colleagues and I published in 2014. It was a retrospective on the history of appliance standards uh, these blue lines are, or data points are the full cost of ownership of appliance, the purchase price plus the cost of electricity. Uh, this is United States data. We also looked at European data. And uh, these uh, dashed lines uh, started with California appliance standards. They get increasingly better, more stringent. You couldn't sell appliances below a certain efficiency, followed by federal standards. Uh, also for room air conditioners, clothes washers, central air conditioning. What's the red? The red is uh, the purchase price. Inflation adjusted, quality adjusted purchase price of the refrigerator. Not the operating cost and purchase price, just the purchase price. And uh, it was very surprising because um, everybody expected when standards kick in, the purchase price goes up. But it didn't. And indeed, in a couple of cases, standards seem to stimulate the purchase price to go down. So in economic lingo, this is called a market failure. Why would you uh, need a standard to make a more efficient appliance that actually costs your customers less money? It should have happened automatically. It's the old wise saying, or old saying, I wouldn't call it wise, of the free market economists. How many Free market economists, does it change, take to change the light bulb? The answer is none. If the light bulb needed changing, the free market would have done it. <laughs> OK. So um, refrigerator costs declined by 28% for each doubling pr production. Uh, if you look 
and you take the refrigerators along, uh, personal and commercial refrigerators, and you look at the energy consumption, and you just extrapolate their efficiency curves had there been no standards, we find that uh, we could have turned, we could have built the equivalent of 30 nuclear reactors. We're saving energy equivalent to 30 nuclear reactors or more than all the coal plants in Ohio because we have more efficient refrigerators that actually save consumers money. Standards was a good thing. Uh, they actually started here in California. They started here in Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory uh, due to Art Rosenfeld and his colleagues. So they were really something that Berkeley and Berkeley Lab can feel proud of. Um, I should also say we got excited about the re results. We submitted to Science Magazine. It went out for review. One reviewer said, this is fantastic. It's going to change things. And the other two said, I don't care what these guys say. The economists are not going to believe it. <laughs> My insight and, uh, well, economists don't think like physicists. Um, all right. Uh, <laughs> anyway, let me talk about clean energy sources. Uh, cost of wind in the United States. 1980, there was a, a supply issue, a bulge. It's worked its way out. It's coming down again. And wind started uh, being installed by a tremendous amount. If you look at the long-term contracts being signed today, let's say you're a developer. You want to build a wind farm in the uh, Midwest. Uh, you borrow money. You get uh, utility. Before you, people will loan you money, uh, they want to see a power purchase agreement that utility companies will buy your wind at a certain price to guarantee that they're going to have a, a good return on equity. Uh, and uh, the per power purchase agreements being sold today in the Midwest are two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. The cost of new energy, if you build a new natural gas plant, at $4 a million BTU, it's five cents a kilowatt hour. Now, there's a production tax credit, but if you work out that production tax credit and say, what would it really cost? It's about the cost of new natural gas at a historically low prices. So it's getting competitive. Uh, we have great wind in the United States uh, over the oceans and the Great Lakes, and the Midwest is really, really good. And sometimes the wind is blowing here, over here, here, here. It doesn't stop everywhere all the time. And so that will go towards a lot of developing the wind resources. Wind in the next few years will equal hydroelectric power in electricity generated and used. It's about 5% today. Hydroelectric is 6.5% today. Okay? So it's racing ahead. Very good news. They're big. This is an offshore wind turbine being installed. This one happens to be 6.5 megawatts. Uh, the diameter of those rotors is 154 meters. You may not get a sense of the scale of 154 meters. The Wright brothers' first flight was 36 meters. <laughs> Okay, one and a half soccer fields may help you <laughs> image what one 154 meters are. Okay, they're big, they're getting more efficient, uh, but the offshore wind turbines are still two and a half times more expensive, and so they're going to have to come down. But Europe is installing lots of them. Uh, solar, good news in solar. This is a graph of some data taken. Uh, made by 1366, uh, a startup solar company. Uh, beginning in 1978, this is the price versus uh, cumulative production. That's called a learning curve. Every time you increase deployment by an order of magnitude, the price goes down by a certain fraction. You increase by another order of magnitude, the price goes down by a certain fraction. That's uh, almost universal. And so in 2008, they projected that here's today's price, and maybe by 2015, we will be here. We're not. We're there. Uh, where's there? It's getting competitive with wholesale electricity. Um, uh, so in the history of the United States, we had virtually no solar before about 1990. It simmered along, very, very flat. And then all of a sudden, something happened. What happened? Well, I became Secretary of Energy. <laughs> now. <laughs> You, 
you may say correlation does not mean causation. <laughs> That's what the tobacco companies say. <laughs> Uh, but in this case, it's demonstrably incorrect because most of my loan program went to helping people install large wind and solar farms. What is not widely known is the loan program, including the losses of Solyndra, Solyndra and Fisker and others, net net for all the loans will make the federal government five billion bucks. Why? Because all these projects are going to make money. Now, since you guys are in the business school, you figure out how to make five billion bucks from 2009 to 2013 when you're only allowed to charge one and a half percent interest. <laughs> okay, we weren't out to make, if I was able to charge what I could get, I could make the country 20 billion dollars. Okay, so it wasn't costing the taxpayer net net anything, but the banks were not willing to loan for large solar and wind farms. But they told it was too risky, and so there was, we weren't crowded in any market as well. And so now, now they are willing to, in fact, they're willing to loan it at lower rates uh, than some oil companies. Okay, so times have changed. And uh, so we don't need a loan program for solar and wind anymore. Uh, we have good solar, this is the United States. Fantastic solar. All the United States except Seattle and Alaska. <laughs> That's Germany. Same color. <laughs> Germany's the biggest installer of solar, used to be, but uh, China will pass uh, this year. Uh, so uh, let's have more politically correct colors. It's the same scale, uh, so that Europe doesn't look quite as bad. But <laughs> Look at all where this is fantastic solar all around here. You don't want to have solar in Siberia and in England and wherever, but it's pretty good. Solar requires a lot of land. If you wanted to do the total conversion of, you know, 15% conversion, how much land do you need? Uh, you need that much land. You probably didn't see that. <laughs> so I will say you need that much land for 10 times. Okay, now. It, so it's, it's land use, but it depends on where you need it, because most people need the electricity in cities, and there is not enough uh, places to install solar in cities. So, but, but you're going to have to do something about that. Now, um, renewable energy in Spain and Portugal is about 25% wind and solar. It's about 20% in Germany. In Denmark, it's higher, but they're tied to a grid. Ireland, it's about 20, 25%. But when you go from 10 or 20% to 50%, you've got to think of a lot of things. You've got to have not only uh, a, a robust distribution system, but you need to think about long distance transmission. And, and to be quite candid, uh, uh, when you're at 50%, you need backup power, energy on demand power. And that is part of the cost of renewable energy. But it will take a couple of decades to get to 50% if all goes well. And by that time, solar and wind get even cheaper. So I think by mid-century, solar and wind with the more robust distribution system and some energy storage and distribution over a couple of time zones are also important, uh, it will be still cheaper or at least competitive with fossil fuels. Okay, some debates. We can do local generation storage and use, so who needs the grid? I don't think many people will actually want to disconnect from the grid. Uh, and so this is a false debate, you need both. Because the really massive amounts of wind and solar, the good news is there, there, were people, there are no people, or very few people, and the bad news is there are not the people around. But you have inexpensive land where there are few people. OK. Um, this is a country where right of way and stringing transmission lines doesn't seem to be as big a problem as in the United States. Uh, and they uh, are, the, most of their renewables in wind and solar are in the western part of China. And most of the people are in the eastern part of China. So they're uh, designing and building a large integrated system to take advantage of this. For example, they've installed a 2,000 kilometer uh, 
DC line, uh, and it only loses, it loses less than 7% of the energy in going 2,000 kilometers. There is no line in the United States uh, that goes 2,000 kilometers. If it did, at the highest voltage, most efficient lines we have today would lose over 80% of their energy. Okay, just to give you a comparison of what this is about. And they're gonna install even better ones. So you can go 3,000 kilometers within a decade and 5% of the energy. You can go transcontinental without losing energy. Energy storage. Uh, there are many forms of energy storage. Here's one that people forgot about. When the wind blows, you pump water. Remember those old windmills in the Midwest 150 years ago? <laughs> uh, that's energy storage. You've used the energy to pump the water uh, out of your well, and it's ready for use. And you use the water when you feel like it. Uh, nowadays, people are building power plants. You have excess energy or cheap power at night. You use it to chill a big tank of cold water to run your central air conditioning system during the day. Uh, but let's talk about batteries. When I was in the Department of Energy, we had a program, EV Everywhere, that stands for electric vehicles everywhere. And in 2008, the manufacturing costs were a lot. There were, the usable amount of energy was $1,000 a kilowatt hour. Uh, and uh, in 2011, we set this audacious goal. But in 2012, uh, it was $500 a kilowatt hour, we said, is it possible to get the price down for automobiles? The whole manufacturing cost of not only the battery, but the battery pack and the electronics to be $150 a kilowatt hour, and for utility scale storage, 100 bucks. That means it's as cheap as hydroelectric storage, pump storage, and that would really change a lot of things. Uh, and they thought we were smoking something. Um, I don't smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even inhale, I don't, I don't smoke well. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, where, where, how are we doing? Uh, this is a projection by Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Their projection is a solid curve as a function of time, 2030, but those X's are the actual manufacturing costs that are estimated, and if Tesla builds their gigafactory, uh, they say it's due to completion 2016. They say that the manufacturing cost should be about $100 a kilowatt hour. So I applied the Elon Musk correction factor. <laughs> <laughs> I moved it over two years and I increased by 30%. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and anyway, uh, but this, this goal is actually where we thought we'd be by 2022. So that's looking pretty good. Um, actually, it's looking pretty good, but currently the batteries for the Tesla, the long range batteries, are 85 kilowatt hours, and they cost about $30,000 to make the battery and battery pack. It's about uh, a quarter of the cost of the car. The cars list for about $100,000, but you're not gonna buy it unless you buy all the gizmos. <laughs> and so, um, in any case, um, so Yi Shui, who was a postdoc here at Berkeley, a professor at Stanford, he and I are, are working on batteries. Uh, we've got so far two battery patents, but the really good one we haven't done yet uh, because we're working on something uh, where it's not a carbon anode, it's not a silicon anode, but it's a, a, a lithium sulfur battery where this is the energy density. Now we may fail completely, uh, or it may work, or someone else smarter than us may get something to work. But the goal here is five times the density of the best car batteries of today with at least 10 times the charging rate. It's a very simple goal. Uh, you say the battery has to last longer than the human bladder. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> you drive 200 miles and you need a pit stop. And during the time of that pit stop, uh, while you're doing your stuff, your battery is being recharged. If it's, that's okay. If you have to wait 20 minutes, people think that's a downer. But waiting five minutes is okay. Okay, it takes three minutes to, or four minutes to fill up your car anyway. So, so there's hope, but this is research. All right. 
Um, project 20 or 30 years down in the future, ahead in the future. I think renewables, wind and solar, are going to get really dirt cheap. Levelized cost of renewables, uh, new renewables, is going to be two or three cents a kilowatt hour. And at that cost, you can begin to think of all sorts of things you can do uh, with this really inexpensive energy. But 30 years in the future, I don't think fossil fuel uh, electricity is going to be that cheap. But this is not distribution source. This is just generating this stuff. So if you have cheap wind and solar, the combination, and you can manage the capex costs and, and figure out how to do this, can you take CO2 captured from smokestacks, for example, and turn it into CO and carbon monoxide and oxygen? Or can you take uh, energy and split water uh, from that into hydrogen and oxygen? And you want to do these things to begin to make chemical fuel storage. Hydrogen is a chemical fuel storage, so is CO. But they're higher order fuels, and the highest order fuels that have the most money are uh, hydrocarbons that look like this. This is what you find in gasoline and diesel. Uh, and so if you can do this, you're now beginning to recycle carbon dioxide. And so, and really the recycling means capturing it from the air, combine it with hydrogen, make a hydrocarbon, burn it, capture it from the air again. That's a true recycle. Then that's real sustainability in energy. You can ship hydrocarbons around the world for a couple bucks a barrel, anywhere in the world. We have that technology. So that becomes a long distance transmission line. It becomes a super high density battery. So that's some of the other things we need. Now let me mention briefly uh, my time in the Department of Energy. I didn't know the president-elect. I never supported a political candidate in my life publicly. Uh, but for whatever reason, he wanted to hire a scientist. And uh, I met him in the third week in November. And I uh, uh, went to Chicago and, and I came back home. And I told my wife, uh, if he asked me, I'll, I'll say yes. And he asked me. Uh, so there's where I went. Uh, I did a couple of things while I was there. I started the Advanced Research Projects Agency. It's a new funding agency that wanted to support daring, high-risk, high high-reward applied projects. I looked at Bell Labs and Los Alamos and other things and said, can we have longer-term projects, still high-risk, but with a 10-year horizon that can uh, span things from more fundamental things, but actually with a focus on delivering the goods. And then we uh, totally revamped our solar program. And um, now I've been told I should talk to the students about you know, your futures and all these things. So here's a few things. Lesson one, uh, you make decisions based on expert knowledge and knowing what questions to ask. And people often ask me, you know, I wasn't a politician. How do I make decisions in the Department of Energy? Actually, it's because you have a core set of values. If you have a core set of values and you don't have to worry as much about tactics or polls, and it makes decision making really easy. Uh, in Hurricane Sandy, I said I was going to recommend to the president, we are uh, going to waive the Jones Act for two weeks um, because there's no, we couldn't get refined uh, petroleum products to the New York metropolitan area uh, for at least two weeks. It would take that long to repair the pipelines. Uh, the unions were rattling their swords and saying, don't even think of doing this. We're going to object to it. Um, and besides, you can't get oil up there in time on a tanker. The Jones Act forbids uh, shipping from a US port to a US port unless it's US flagged. And with union people, we have no US flag tankers. They're barges. You can't get enough oil on barges. And uh, uh, well, anyway, I, re I did recommend it to the president. I got the backing of uh, Janet Napolitano, Homeland Security. Ray LaHood, I called them and said, I'm going to do this. You're going to back me in case they ask. They said, sure. I told them why. They said, sure. The president waived the Jones Act for two weeks. The unions didn't lift a voice. Why? Because I said, if they squeak, you know, they're going to lose all credibility. That's common sense. Two weeks. 
And uh, one day after we waived the Jones Act, a BP British tanker uh, en route to Canada changed its course and dumped it in New York. Money speaks. <laughs> but I didn't have to worry about polls or making union people happy. It's just common sense. OK, lesson two. You try to hire great people. You hire people better than you, you know, great people hire people better than they are, and they hire them not to be their assistants, but to be their protégés. So there's a golden rule here. A's hire A's, B's hire C's. How can you tell a B in administration? They want to control information. All the people below them, they're the funnel, and they talk to the people above. They don't want the people below, you talk to the people above. Okay. So, um, in order to attract and retain the best people, you really got to inspire them. I got a really a lot of good, not good, outstanding people to come to work in the government that never would have thought of working in the government. I, it was simple. I'd get on the phone and I'd say, look, I did this, you can do this, uh, come join me. Even if it's only for two or four years, come join me uh, and help save the world. It worked half the time. <laughs> uh, and you have to kindly, constantly remind them, we are helping save the world. Uh, and so, and then you have to let your protégés spread their wings. And you have to protect them. And in looking back in hindsight, the most important role, my role, was to get these great people and then block and tackle for them. You said, OK, go. Your RPE folks, go. Decide what you're going to fund. Go. I would sit there and brainstorm technically, but as a technical person, not as their boss. Uh, but they ultimately decided what they wanted to fund and what new programs they wanted to uh, start. And you have to protect them from the bureaucracy and some of the people in the government, long timers. Uh, they call them weebies. I call them weebies. We be here, you be gone. We'll wait you out. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, they didn't like it when people were working 60 hours a week uh, because, you know, it made their 25 hours a week look bad. <laughs> uh, um, so I also told people, and I sometimes in other ways remind my people in my group, the greatest danger lies, for most of us, the, great the greater danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. And that was said by Michelangelo. Now it's, oh, I've been going 40 minutes, okay. Now I'm gonna start a little bit into winding down, but I wanna conclude, if I can keep steady, of a quote, uh, I'm quoting myself again, I love to quote myself. <laughs> uh, um, if you're gonna plagiarize, plagiarize from the best. <laughs> No, seriously, uh, <laughs> um, this, is, this is an article I wrote uh, as a, um, a festschrift for Eugene Cummins, who was my PhD thesis advisor. Uh, and he, uh, it's actually, it was in 2001, not 2011. And uh, I conclude this long article by saying, I worked side by side with Gene for most of my seven years with him, oftentimes more than 10 hours a day, literally in the last 10 hours a day. What did I learn from him during this time? What he taught me is sometimes it's okay to abandon an experiment that's not going well, and that it's sometimes important to stick doggedly to other experiments. Gene also stressed the importance of writing clearly. When I presented him with the first draft of my thesis, it, I wrote in two weeks, it was a rush job, he showed me a rare moment of irritation and he lectured me, be more precise. Let the reader know exactly what are the ideas and what's been done. And I began to appreciate clear writing was synonymous with clear thinking. And for people in my group, they, this is what I harp on all the time. So I also went, I, when I began to choose research errors and simply followed my nose, well, that clear vision of the future, sometimes I felt I was disappointing Gene with my wayward habits of working on things that were not manifestly important. Gene and I are similar in many ways, but in this respect, we're different. One of the best things about being mentored by Gene is that he allowed me to be different than him. 
In my random walking areas that I knew nothing about, I was armed with a self-confidence I would not have had if I were not Gene's student. I always felt that Gene treated me as special. Gradually, I realized that Gene treated all his students this way. He believed in us, and as a consequence, we began to believe in ourselves. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, in this extraordinary nurturing atmosphere, we developed the self-confidence needed to sustain us through the failures that we would encounter in our future research. So I'm not sure how things would have turned out had I worked for another advisor. What I'm certain about is that I would have achieved far less in my own career. I owe a great deal to Gene for believing in me, for shaping me, and reminding me remaining my model of what a scientist and mentor should be. I'm sorry, because he's dying. So um, let me conclude. I re uh, announced my resignation uh, February 2013. Um, and February 7, 2013, I announced it February 1. Uh, I walked into the office, and one of the things I hated dealing with was the press, but there was a press headline. It said, hungover energy secretary <laughs> wakes up next to solar panel. <clears throat> I'll read you part of the story. Washington sources have reported that following a long night of carousing in a series of DC watering holes, Energy Secretary Stephen Chu awoke Thursday morning to find himself sleeping next to a giant solar panel he met the previous evening. <laughs> According to sources, Chu's encounter with his crystalline solar receptor was his most regrettable dalliance since 2009, when an extended fling with a 90-foot wind turbine nearly ended his marriage. <laughs> now, normally, we don't answer scurrilous press reports, but, uh, but my... Uh, Head of Press Affairs said, we have to answer this one. I smiled <laughs> and said, sure. And by noon that day, I issued the following release. This is only part of it. I just want everyone to know that my decision not to serve a second term as Energy Secretary has absolutely nothing to do with the allegations <laughs> made in this week's edition of The Onion. While I'm not going to confirm or deny the charges specifically, <laughs> I will say that clean, renewable solar power is a growing source of US jobs and is becoming more and more affordable. So it's no surprise that lots of Americans are falling in love with solar. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh. There were limits. They didn't let me say, regardless of your sexual orientation. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I should also say that my wife stood by me on this one. <laughs> uh, what she said was, they did a bad job of Photoshop. You don't have hair on your arms. <laughs> All right, so in conclusion, uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. It's uh, called Earthrise, and it's Apollo 8, uh, the first orbit the moon in preparation for the uh, moon landing. And in this photograph, you see a very bleak lunar landscape. You see a wonderful looking Earth. And the astronaut who took the picture said, we came all this way to explore the moon. And the most important thing is we've discovered the Earth. The message to take away is the moon is not a good place to live. <laughs> From this vantage point, Earth is pretty good. And guess what? Nowhere else to go. So since 1968, very compelling evidence that humans are changing the climate, going in a very bad direction. Big risk. We don't know the big uncertainties, but huge risks. And um, there's an old saying that I, I don't know how old it is, but I say it. And uh, if we don't watch out, we'll end up where we're headed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
We have time for a few questions, and we'll have to make them quick. But, and also, please use the microphone, because we do have the video rolling. Please. Thank you. I, I hold this spot because it's TV. Uh, my name is Danny. I'm the uh, MBA student here. Uh, thank you very much for speaking with us today. Um, so I have a question um, related. Uh, so you are, you are Chinese American, right? So what are ch the challenges you are facing uh, as a Chinese American working in an agency, and how are you dealing with that? Especially the case like uh, Wen He Li and nuclear science that incident happens. Thank you. Um, so the question, in case you didn't understand, pick it all up, was what are the challenges as a Chinese American working in the Department of Energy, especially with Wen He Li and all these other issues? And I didn't feel that that was an issue at all, quite candidly. Uh, they looked at me as a scientist, not even as a politician, mercifully, because I wasn't in politics, but as a scientist. And it, it simply, I don't believe it was an issue at all. Question two up here. Um, uh, what do you think of algae fuel? I remember a few years back I was reading about it. It said that it could recover about 75% of 75% efficiency with carbon dioxide? Yeah, uh, I'm not, it, algae, at least in the near term future, next five or 10 years, I don't think will be a major uh, player. When I was Secretary of Energy, I, I loved the job because I was able to do what I call deep intellectual dives into it. We, you know, when the Secretary of Energy invites a company or a scientist to come in and talk technically for an hour, they love it. And uh, what I found, and to summarize those conversations, including six companies, uh, they did not see within the five, next five or 10 years where they could produce fuel from algae at a total cost of $5 a gallon. If you can't produce fuel at two bucks a gallon, and this was when oil was $90 a barrel, $100 a barrel, you can't produce it economically. So the break even, is $2 a gallon production cost when gasoline was four. And they couldn't see them getting below six to eight within 10 years. That's not to say one shouldn't look at some things like this, but it's not something that uh, you should be investing your personal savings in in the next five years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you mentioned on um, China's transmission grid. What's the main barriers to the U.S. following suit? Uh, Right-of-way passage. Uh, lots of people don't like transmission lines visible to them. Um, surprisingly, um, one of the uh, barriers is an uh, agency of the federal government, the Fish and Wildlife Agency within the Interior, don't want transmission lines anywhere in the state forests. And, uh, you know, national, it's certainly national parks, you're not going to put in transmission lines in Yosemite, but, but in, in a lot of federally owned lands. Um, so that's, that is a major barrier, uh, the right of way. Uh, uh, there was a big effort to try to streamline that from time of first application by time, if you're allowed to make the transmission line, uh, it was 10 years. I was trying hard to get this to 30 months. It was a multi-agency problem. One of the cabinet members, unnamed, un not unnamed, said, well, I remember uh, if the U US Department of Energy wants to assume total responsibility of this, uh, they can do that. And I said to me, OK, I'll do it. <laughs> Again, you know, I'm not a politician, so. <laughs> and, and then I got phone calls, or my staff got phone calls an hour later saying, it didn't really mean it. <laughs> uh, so, so there is a lot of inertia in doing this, and people are concerned about it. Uh, and it, it's always going to be a trade-off. Uh, the other thing I should stress is, is you don't want to have a spaghetti of transmission lines going all over everywhere. You want to have a few that are very efficient, uh, high energy, trans high power transmission lines. So the DC system is a way to do it. Even before our Secretary of Energy, I was talking about this, but there's, there's, there's not enough uh, leadership in the country to, uh, uh, to do this. It would be, it would be uh, like a tenth of a cent a kilowatt hour. You could get a DC backbone 
that could make our transmission line actually come into the 21st century. It's, it was most, it's mostly built a long, long time ago, and it's very old. Uh, Marcus Lehman, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Clean Tech Incubator. I had a question, wind and solar are not the only renewable sources, but then looking how fast the technology progressed compared to turbines or engines, um, what do you think were like the critical steps and yeah, reasons or factors that actually brought uh, wind I, and solar? I missed your first <coughs> sentence. The wind and solar, but what else? What are the two? So uh, wind and solar is um, affordable and competitive at the moment. So how, what were the critical steps okay. that brought the technology there um, that we can learn for other resources to follow? I think, you know, since the oil shocks in Carter, there were a, a lot of subsidies uh, that began, uh, but uh, after Reagan came in, those subsidies were kind of diminished greatly. And what happened in actual fact, it was the European subsidies that made solar and wind really drive down the cost curve. Uh, Germany, Denmark, uh, especially, but m many European subsidies in the 80s and 90s that allowed it to mature, uh, because you you have to get the ma technology to mature in production methods in actual field deployment. Learn from those lessons. Uh, you know, it's no longer in the laboratory. It's really, it's really that's how industry drives down cost curves. Um, if there's any other promising technology, you would need subsidies at the beginning. But you should always, if you think of subsidies, you should always think of them as a sunset clause. In the early days of the oil shocks, there were uh, excessive subsidies, in my opinion, on uh, alternative fuels, synthetic fuels. And they were so high that companies got in to do it while the subsidies were there, but as soon as the subsidies would leave, their business plan was to get out. So you need to get it so the business plan is to survive the first few years, but you're gonna be on your own. Uh, and so I think that's, so you get the really sincere players. Right? Uh, Stephen, this is a small gesture of our collective thanks. The Berkeley MBA, we know you will wear it with pride at your place of current employment. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.